to the air conditioning and heat, please turn the heat off. Because if we keep it going in another 20 minutes, we'll all be asleep. <laughs> Thank you, Brady. A lesson from the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down. They cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. Here ends the lesson. Mm -hmm. Please join me in saying Psalm 126 antiphonally by half verse. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. Mark, are you up for reading a letter? Sure. Thank you. A lesson from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. If anyone else thinks he is confident in the flesh, I have more reason. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever these things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them mere rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the base of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already grasped it or all have ready become perfect, but I press on if I may also take hold of that for which I was even taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the lesson. Would you all please stand now for the gospel acclamation. Lord Jesus, open the scriptures to us. Make our hearts burn while you speak to us. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Lord Christ. Therefore, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a dinner there, and Martha was serving, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very expensive perfume, of pure nard, 
and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who intended to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for three hundred denarii and the proceeds given to the poor people? Now he said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he kept the money box, he used to steal from what was put into it. Therefore Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please pray with me. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, kindle in us the fire of your love, and by that divine light illuminate your holy word to us this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Please be seated. Would you turn out the rest of the lights? I think there'll be enough ambient light that will be safe if we need to walk away. Thanks, Efren. <clears throat> Is that on me? Thank you. I don't know if some of you know the expression, let go and let God. There's another version of that is let go or get dragged. <laughs> and there's a certain amount of that that is being preached uh, through the readings that we have today. I'm just going to take care of something for a moment. Just. Okay. You say let go and let God or let go and let Satan. I don't think of people think of that as that, that's the choice. I think people think of our choices are God's way, Satan's way, and my way. I just think that's how people conceive it. I would never want to follow Satan. And I don't believe in God. So I do it my way, that's all. But the Gospels don't really give you that choice, I'm sorry to say. It's God's way or Satan's way is your way. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. If you reject God's way, you're in rebellion. That's the way it goes. And um, there's no change to that. There's no appeal. It's just one of those things. It, it, it's what it is. And I know, you know, it may seem like, gee, that's kind of firm, but there are an awful lot of things in life that are either A or B. It, it's, you know, either we're married or we're not married. You know, either you're dead or you're alive. You know, it's, it, there's no either or on. I mean, there's no, yeah, you, you have another choice. If you reject God's way, you're in rebellion. If in rebellion, you're in league with Satan, and he is the father of all rebellions. So here we go, the Isaiah passage. What's the let go part of that? Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. Mm -hmm. You hear that message again, Mark, in the letter to the Philippians, where Paul is saying, I'm not looking back on my past. I'm letting go of all of that. He's telling these other people, you have some idea of who I am and how I work and all of that. That's fine. Put it away. I'm going to be working in a new way. And if you're hanging on to the old way, you're not going to get it. And the let God is, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? And actually the audience for this, who were the Jews who were taken off to Babylon and waiting there for their appointed 70 years. They did not perceive it, a lot of them. God is saying, I'll do it my way. And what he tells them 
is profoundly offensive. He tells them, I'm going to send you a deliverer, and they're waiting on it, and it's going to be Cyrus. And they say, Cyrus is a guy, is a Gentile, he's a Persian, he's uncircumcised, he's a militaristic, terrible, imperialistic. No, 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 no. He's got to be a nice Jewish boy. What's going on here? And he's like, no. Get over it. They don't get over it. Not a lot of them do. Because before I studied all of this, I thought, how, how did not all the Jews in Babylon just go, let's go back home. Let's go back. We're going to the promised land. And they didn't. And if, if, if some of the research is right, most of them stayed in Babylon. Not many of them went. And you're thinking, look at this miracle. This is so awesome and so amazing. But... Cyrus wasn't fitting the way they felt God should be doing this. So uh, we're not going. And I think others, perhaps in a more human, if I dare say selfish way, is, you know, and I, I don't mean to make uh, light of it, but I'm trying to make it real for you. It's like, look, our kids are in school. They're going to the soccer league. I got a business here. Already I inherited from my father or second generation. You know, we give all this up. You go back. I'll pray for you. And, and I think on some level, that was true for a lot of people. They've been there. From, some of them had been born there. Some of them didn't even know how to speak Hebrew. They were that far away from it. And there's God performing this world history changing miracle in front of them. And it's like, they're not getting it. And this is the other part. Let go or get dragged. Because God's not changing his plans, even though they don't fit in with yours. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And it will. Thank you very much, whether you pray for it or not. His kingdom is coming, and he's going to do what he's going to do, as he always does. And you're so welcome to be a part of it. But the train's pulling out, and you'll be left at the station if you don't want to get on. Let go. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. We see this message said in a very simple way in the big book of AA. It's about discipleship. These ideas were put into the big book by a man named Sam Shoemaker, who was an Episcopal priest and a devout evangelical. Uh, he also had a very high view of sacrament. And according to Bill Wilson, Bill Wilson said it's actually Sam Shoemaker who wrote the steps. Interesting. And when you look into this, you find a simple, uh, enunciation of a lot of biblical principles, but it's put into a very easy package for regular people to follow. And you can see in the writing, it's inspired by Isaiah and Paul, what we heard today, and Jesus himself. Listen to what this says out of the big book. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. If you have decided that you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. Well, that's the invitation to discipleship, Bob. You've got to be willing to go to any length. You've got to be willing to die every day and pick up your cross. That's quite a length to go to. At some of these, we balked. Of course, we all do. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Here you go. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas. That is, they're not doing what Isaiah told them to do. And they're not following Paul's model. We're hanging, trying to hang on to our old ideas. And the result was nil until we let go absolutely. God in Isaiah is saying, let go of all your old ideas. The big book is an all or nothing proposition. Results are nil unless you let go absolutely, just like your prescription, right, Judith? How many people, I don't know if you ever did this, I hope you weren't so foolish as I have been in my life, where you're taking the medicine, supposed to take it for 10 days, around four or five, you're feeling good, you hate taking medicine, you stop using it. 
the infection comes back stronger than ever. And now we have to go up the ante on the next medicine. And please, Michael, would you please take it the 10 days? Because if you only do a half measure, you, get, you don't get just nil. You actually make it worse. So this is not a hard message for us to understand. Real life is a witness to the truth of this. But it still makes it difficult. See Paul, when he's talking about, I was this, I was that, and that, he's talking about his whole life. And he's referring to it as lost. The word in Greek used for loss is a word he used for the shipwreck, the things that were lost. It's like in a business effort when you write off a loss, you take a loss. That's how he did it. Well, we just take a loss on that. What? My life. Really? And the other word he does, uses, it says loss once, loss twice, and the next word they use is scubalon, which they always or mostly translate as rubbish. But it means animal dung. And we have a colloquial word for that, don't we, Ephraim? And, uh, never heard it. Never heard of it. That's right. And, uh, and, and it's this idea that it's hard to say that he's saying that this life of his is worthless but also detestable in case you miss that. Why is Paul so negative? <laughs> you know? You might be thinking that of me. Why are you so negative, man? Come on, let's go. It seems such a worthy resume that he's like, huh. Here's what's wrong. It diverted his attention from God and led to self-righteousness. It drew him away from God instead of drawing him closer. And ultimately, he wound up at enmity with God. Well, of course, not only worthless, but detestable. Now you'll be glad you came today. How about you? Andrew, you knew I'd put you on the spot. Come on now. How about you? How about you? Is your resume diverting your attention from God and feeding your sense of self-accomplishment? Is your resume drawing you away from God instead of drawing him closer? Is your resume habituating you to a life run by self-will instead of God's will? Mark, it's Lent. We have to self-examine. <laughs> this is important. Think about it. Today's gospel account, Mary's actions, what do they mean? She is exemplifying the kind of life that I've been preaching about today and we're reading about. The nard, sometimes called the spike nard, it likely comes from the mountains of India. Isn't that marvelous, Mark? You think of this ancient times trade over all those mountains where Afghanistan is and that, and making its way to the northern reaches of India and bring it all the way back. Well, it's very expensive stuff. It's worth a year's wages of the average guys working. Sometimes these things were heirlooms. They, they were saved for, for a generation or more. Now, the fact that she might anoint the head of an honored guest would be quite traditional, but not the feet. The feet, even today in Mideastern culture, the feet are just so wrong. It's, it, they're dirty, they're... All kinds of implications culturally on the feet. And, and some of you may remember, you know, when they overthrew Iraq, some people in the streets, they would have a picture of Saddam Hussein, and they were hitting him with a shoe. And this is a particularly insulting thing in that culture, the shoes, the feet. And on top of that, her hair on his feet... Her hair shouldn't be down anyway. It should be covered. The hair is seen as the glory of the woman. It has all kinds of implications in this culture that we don't have in ours. But believe me, you know, I, I don't want to come up with some image that might be really rude. But, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's an exciting thing, let me put it that way, in this culture, to see a woman with her hair down. And it is not to be done with the rabbi there. She might have her hair down with the brother and her sister, Lazarus and 
Martha, okay, not with him. And then on top of it, it's the feet and that hair and the hair on the feet. It's like, this is terrible. Behold, I am doing a new thing. I should say so. That's very new in this culture. All of the above is new and shocking and amazing and stunning. And there she is anointing a king and a corpse. The king, kingly anointing and the anointing of a corpse are both indicated here. And what are you seeing in her? Everything I valued, I now count as loss. Me, my hair, which is the epitome of a woman's glory, wiping feet. This heirloom that I inherited, that's worth the work, done. What else? What else do you want? My dignity, done. Keep going. What else can I toss off here? When it's seen in the presence and the light of Christ. Behold, I'm making all things new. You've got to get ready for that. Chuck Chamberlain, who is one of the most uh, honored people in the history of AA, certainly in uh, Southern California, he wrote a book that was based on several of his talks. And the title of the book is from his talks, and it's called A New Pair of Glasses. Mm -hmm. A New Pair of Glasses. That's what we need. <clears throat> We need a new pair of glasses. That's what it's calling. We need to see when it says in Isaiah, do you perceive it now? And they're going, no. But we need to say, yes. Especially you, if you are ready, if you are willing to go to any length, to do to any length, to go to any length. You must be able to get ready to be made new. And how other language we have, Bob, to be born again, to be born from above, fine. But you need to be ready to be renewed. And when you listen to me, and remember I quoted uh, an Eastern uh, Orthodox teacher, one of the great ones, uh, believe it or not, Ephraim, I think his name was Ephraim the Syrian, um, but he was talking, uh, or it might have been another fellow, but he said, you know, the whole life of a Christian is, is repent. We're talking about baptism. And he said, you repent before baptism, you repent at baptism. And you repent after baptism. And, and it's, you know, some people think of that, oh, you're constantly repenting. You're constantly being renewed. It's a wonderful thing. We want to continue to be refreshed and renewed and see things differently, of course. It's wildly extravagant what Mary is doing. And she's saying Jesus is worth it. And Paul and the big book language affirmed that. The lamb is worthy. Take me, all of me. What do we say in marriage? All that I am and all that I have. I'm going to honor you, you know, as I marry you. Here's a good question. If it's all that I am and all that I have, well, who are you? And what do you have? If someone said to you, who are you and what do you have? They'd be interesting. And I always say, are you the owner of these things or the owned? What exactly do you think you own? And do you own it or does it own you? The one thing I have fun with, I don't know if we talked about this, Andrew. I. I it, does anyone belong to a homeowner's association or have you ever? And I assume you live in California <laughs> or elsewhere. And, and I find people really believe they own their homes. They really, they think that. They think they own it. And they don't realize they're renting it from the state. Just stop paying your property taxes. And eventually you'll find out who owns that house and property that you think you own. You do not own it. I mean, you may think, oh, well, that's kind of cute. It's not at all cute. Just don't pay your property taxes. See how cute it gets. They'll take it. And then they'll auction it off. <laughs> you know? 
And so sometimes the things we think we own, it's like, it's worth thinking through. And it's certainly thinking through whether the things you think you own have more power over you and demand so much of your time, your attention, your talent. It's like, maybe I should sell this car. <laughs> taking up a lot of money and this and that. It's like, it's a wonderful thing to do in Lent, especially just to review. Like, what am I looking at this? How much am I just taking for granted? And uh, and by the way, how's that all working for you? All your stuff and all your ideas about who you are, you and your possessions. Are you ready for God to do a new thing in you and in your life? And you may say, no. I say, your move. God's going to be moving on, just so you know. The, the train keeps going. Mm -hmm. God's will will be done. Who is that comedian? Jeff, I think. You're, you're, you're probably a, a redneck if. Foxworthy. You know. Foxworthy. Huh? Jeff Foxworthy. 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 <laughs> I don't like the R word, but... Anyway, I thought I would. <laughs> he might help me out here, you know. You're probably ready for God to do a new thing in you if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. There's a wide range that fits this. For some of us, that symptom presents as from low to medium level malaise, a kind of spiritual tinnitus. It could move into cynicism, a quiet pessimism, make you go all the way to despair and depression. It's kind of one, one end of the scale. On the other side of the scale, you can go from being irritable, restless, resentful, discontent, all the way to lack of emotional self-control, loss of impulse control, bursts of anger, violence, self-harm, abuse of others. And then I say, aren't you glad you came this morning? <laughs> if this is a good news, why on earth is a bad news? Well, you know, the good news comes as an answer to those who are living in the bad news. That's all. Freedom from the bondage of self and a life and a family and the kingdom of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a good news. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what's waiting for you. And the door's wide open. But he had found God, and in finding God, had found himself. There's a line from the big book. Can you imagine? The guy found himself. The bondage of self, and in finding God, had found himself. This is the essence of our problem. We have a false self. There's always a lie somewhere in there. And we're, if we're living a false self, we're living a stolen life. There's an old Betty Davis movie called A Stolen Life, where she had an identical twin. I think she killed her. And then she took on her life. And she was leading and living the sister's life. And we, pre-Christ, are living a stolen life. We're living the life of someone we kind of made up in our head and we're told we were by family of origin and other social factors and other things that we made up on our own, but it's not the person that Christ reveals us to be. And you find this person in recovery realizes that it was in finding God that he finally found out who he really was. The hero's journey in literature throughout the ages is typically one in which he discovers his true identity. So this, this is hard baked into the human experience, the fallen human, we don't, that, that's why it's in all these myths around the world. And that is everyone's journey. And we find our true identity in and through Christ. And once you discover that and live it, nothing else matters, and that's Paul and Mary. No human being can figure out who he is in and of himself. It can only occur in relationship. It's like needing two vectors to, to cross to find a point somewhere. The one vector doesn't do it. You need the second at least, and now you found out where you are. 
Now we know what we're doing. And it is relationship with others that we really come into contact and understanding of who we are. And according to the Bible, this is why you go back into uh, the, the, the Pentateuch, the, the Torah, the number one thing is thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and soul. Your love relationship with God, that's who you are. That's who you are. And out of that sense of self that comes from that relationship, you take that self and you move through life from there. And you attend to other relationships you wind up having with people. Just as you come out of a family, you know, and you've got a mother, and that's that. And then from there you build other relationships of all different kinds and various stages of intimacy. But that's your basic thing. And Jesus is saying, both in Old and New Testament, it's your relationship with God. That's what you got to get. That's who you are. And move on out into the world from there. Without help, it is too much for us. There is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. This business of, of making this happen, it can't fall on us. We can't do this. And we've already said that half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. This again, are you hearing this message in big book Ephraim? Does this not sound like the Bible or not? This whole thing of giving myself entirely. Aren't you going to sing a hymn later? Come on, brother. Amen. Yes. Amen. And so, I mean, this is so part of the, the, the culture. And I bring in the big book so you can hear it from a different angle. But understand this message is, is, is the same, whether it's going to be in him, whether it's in the Old Testament, whether it's the New Testament, where you're seeing disciples of Christ who have this 12-step program. It's there. I have a thing called the Good Shepherd Guide to the Steps. Here it is. You can find it online. Why? Why do I push this? The 12 steps are simply an orderly way to apply the scriptural principles Christians already espouse. The steps have a natural progression in them that can serve as an outline of discipleship that fits the unique needs of the addict or anyone who struggles with chronic sin. That means every single one of you and me. Otherwise, John is a liar. 1 John 1.8, 1 we're all sinners. In every Christian practice these things on a consistent basis, they would grow tremendously, and so would the church. So we're not going to go through the steps, because that may be daunting to people, and just say, I don't want to do steps. Those drunks do that. All right, I'll pray for you. But in the meantime, here are the basic principles that you need to do. You need to personally identify what the problem of sin is described in Romans 7. That is, you're powerless over it. You're done. You're toast. Oh, what a wretched man am I. Thank God for Jesus. Good. Then you need to commit to turn one's will and one's life over to the care of God, as we see in Paul. As we see in Luke's message of Jesus saying it, pick up your cross every day and die to self. Right. You need to have a confession of sin. This is part of the repentance practice. You confess your sin. You, you certainly self-examine first, and then you confess your sin. James, we confessed our sins, the one to another. We see David confessing to Nathan and to the nation. This is ongoing. We see a confession of sin from Peter. You know, have mercy on me, I'm a sinful man. This is it. This is part of the practice. And then we move on to restitution and reconciliation. We've got to reconcile. Make restitution where we have to. I give you the example of Zacchaeus, the wee little man. That's just what we do. And then we need to continually grow in relationship to God through prayer and personal devotions, which includes communal worship and prayer as well. And then you need to share the good news. You know, if you want to keep it, you've got to give it away. Who knows that? You know that, right? You've got to give it away. The more you give it away, the more it comes. And sharing it, and sharing this way of life with other people, that they may have the gifts that you have come into. And practicing the principles in all our affairs. One of the things that comes up in the 12 and 12, at, at, you know, you can't do everything every day all at once. I take certain things and say, I'm going to, that's this week. <laughs> that's my theme for this week. So it has this outrageous statement in it that we're doing the steps and doing eight and nine, which is about reconciling and that, in order to have the best possible relationship relationship with everyone in the world. Hmm. Does that appeal to you, Trey? 
I wonder you to think of that, because it has been such a, I have laughed through the week. If I take every single, that's mean the person ahead of me in line, in back of me, the cashier, the kid bagging, it's like I'm, I'm out there looking to have the best relationship I can have with every human being, whether they just parked next to me or came out of the gym with me. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's fun. It is wonderful to practice that principle in all my affairs. I mean, you, I guarantee you're going to have a good week. This is not a self-realization program. This is a God realization program. God is going to become realized in and through you. We're going to go back to epiphany. We're all going to be manifestations of the spirit that dwells within us. And we're like instruments that, that are all tuned differently and different kinds of instruments. It's the same power and breath of the Holy Spirit coming into each of us, but because we're all different, different instruments, we resonate and sound differently. So it's a marvelous thing, Andrew. It's not, we don't look like cult members. You know, uh, uh, uh. You know it's not robo-Christian. That, that's not what it is. There's a tremendous diversity and colorfulness and motliness about us that, that we love. But it's the same spirit. It's not a self-help program. It's a God-help program. We're not, we do the preparation. But God does the transformation. Mm -hmm. So we have a part to play in it, but we don't make the transformation happen. He transforms us. And I give you these simple spiritual tools I laid out today so that God can go ahead and do the transformation. And what I laid out to you is the preparation part. That's how you prep your soul and your mind and your body for the Holy Spirit to come in and start transforming it. Is that great? Amen. Get on it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. 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 Would you all please stand now?